you mustn't settle. You cannot quit. That's one small step for man. This year is yours for the taking. A mountain to conquer, a giant to slay. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. That proverbial line in the sand in the journey of life. God is with you. Step out. I have a dream today. He is for you. Step up. You and I were saved by the cross. Let nothing hold you back. Great moments are born from great opportunity. Believe this is your year. Now it's time to see who has the heart. Declare it. We all want to help one another. Human beings are like that. Then make it so. Just curious, how many of you today know you need wisdom in a certain area of life because you're just not sure which direction to go. Anybody need some wisdom today? Maybe it's a relationship or a career, which college to go to. It could be something at work or in business. It could be with your parenting. If you desperately need wisdom, did you know you have a God that generously wants to give it to you? James chapter 1, verse 5. This is the brother of Jesus. He says this. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives what? Say it out loud. Generously. God wants to give you wisdom even more than you want it. But did you know you have a part to play to get God's wisdom? And the problem I want to talk to you about today with this third declaration in our series, I Declare, is many of us are not doing the one thing God's asked us to do to get the wisdom that he wants to give us. And that's this. We're not surrounding ourselves with the right people. So our third declaration, I'm preaching with passion today because I want this as your pastor for every person in our church. It's so big to me. And so I want to give you the declaration again up front. We're going to look at it biblically. And at the end, I'm going to invite all of us to stand. Standing doesn't mean you're taking the declaration. It just means you're standing with us. And if you want to take the declaration, I want to give you a chance to say it out loud and draw a line in the sand today. Here's our third declaration this year, with God's help and the power of the Holy Spirit, I declare I will seek wisdom. My independence, isolation, or even the wrong friends are the enemies of my growth. I refuse to do life apart from godly community. If you look back on your life, I can guarantee something about your life. And that's this. The times that you were the closest to God the times that you grew in your faith the most, the times that you found yourself at the center of God's will are the times that you surrounded yourself with the right godly community. On the flip side, the times that you've fallen away the most, the times that you've felt empty the most, the times that you've struggled with your mental health or other areas, guaranteed you did not have the right people around you. That's certainly true of my life, even when I look back um, I grew up, even as a child, through seventh grade in a town called Wilcox, Arizona. Anybody ever been to Wilcox, Arizona out there? Um, it's a podunk town. There's nothing to do. And I got in trouble a lot. In fact, some of you are going to have a hard time believing this, but you can ask my mom, my teachers at my school. In elementary school, there was a season where I was arguably the worst kid at Wilcox Elementary School. No joke. And ju just to prove it, going... Um, into third grade, I, I'd just gotten out of second grade, and going into third grade, all the third grade teachers met together at Wilcox Elementary School to determine who would draw the short straw to get me in their class. <laughs> I want you to picture in your mind right now the worst kid in your elementary school. Okay, you got them in your mind when you grew up? Now just picture they're your pastor now, okay? <laughs> now, I mean, parents, there's hope, okay? There's hope for some of you. Um, over a two-year period, I went to the principal's office and got a spanking three times. Some of you are like, they spanked in your elementary school? You better believe they spanked in Wilcox Elementary School. It's a different time, right? And one of those spankings came my fourth grade year from a teacher named Mr. Taylor. Now, when I would tell this story forever, Mr. Taylor was almost seven feet tall. And when I would tell that story, Jamie would always say, you're so over-exaggerating. He wasn't seven feet tall. 
And so finally, I got so tired of hearing her say that, and that's what some of you are thinking, um, I broke out the picture of my fourth grade class that had Mr. Taylor in it. You want to see it? All right, here it is. All right, this is my fourth grade class, okay? I am, by the way, on the second row, the third one in with the blonde hair and the bowl cut. It was uh, very pleasing with the ladies at the time, I know. Um, the top row, if you're wondering why that girl on the far right, her face is scratched out, that was the girl we thought had cooties, okay? So uh, <laughs> just, being, just being honest, we scratched her face out. Now look at Mr. Taylor over to the left. The kids, the fourth graders on the third row, that's the third row of bleachers. And Mr. Taylor's still skying over them. He was almost seven feet tall. So, and he also had a paddle that he used to spank with that had holes in it because he thought it hurt worse. So let's just say my fourth grade year, my life changed forever, okay? It actually was a turning point in my life, my fourth grade year. Now, was it because Mr. Taylor spanked me, this seven-foot giant? <laughs> actually, no. Now, it hurt. It probably influenced me. But what changed my fourth grade year is my mom forced me to change my friendships. I'll never forget it. I was hanging out with the worst group of kids, getting in so much trouble. And my mom said, enough. She said, you're not hanging out with them anymore. In fact, we had a sleepover happening. And what happened was my mom said, you are not going to that sleepover. And I will never forget where I was at. I was behind this red shed in our backyard planning to run away. I was so mad at my mom. She told me I couldn't go to that sleepover, and she came out to find me, and I looked at her, and I said to this woman that I love more than almost anyone in the entire world, I said to her these words, I hate you. I still regret it to this day, and you know what my mom did? She didn't even blink. She's like, you're still not going. <laughs> what my mom knew is that if I didn't change my friends, it would change my future. And every parent here knows the same. It's why we spend so much time thinking about our kids' friends, or your parents spent so much time thinking about your friends if, if your parents really, really cared about you. Because every parent knows your kids' friends are determining their future. Now, what's so amazing about this is when we become adults, we completely ignore this principle. Here's what we think Well, I'm an adult, I'm mature, people don't influence me anymore. I'm kind of a big deal. I can hang around whoever I want to and still just be strong in every area. I, I, I was thinking about this week. I thought, you know, at what age as an adult do we outgrow other people influencing who we're becoming? Is it age 30 or 35 or 40 or 50? And the answer is we never outgrow it, ever. It's been said, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And I believe that's 100% true. In fact, Stephen Covey said it this way. He said, you become like the five people you spend the most time with. Choose wisely. That's so true. In fact, Scripture is going to say it this way. I want to look at one verse today out of Scripture from the book of Proverbs written by the wisest man who has ever lived and scripture says it this way, how do we get wisdom? Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20, reading out of the message translation says this, become wise, how? By walking with the wise. Hang out with fools and you watch your life fall to pieces. Solomon, who wrote this, gave us gold in this one verse. So I want, what I wanna do today is I just wanna take this one verse and I want to give you three principles straight from this verse on how you can find wisdom in your life no matter what you need, no matter what you're going through. And here's principle number one. We are told to become wise. What do we have to do? Say the bold out loud with me. Become wise by what? Say it out loud. Walking. 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 Now notice what we're told not to do. It doesn't say become wise by knowing a wise person. Hey, become wise by reading about wise people. Read a biography or other things. Become wise by following a wise person on social media. Hey, become wise by watching them on YouTube or watching TED Talks all the time. That's how you can become wise. Now, none of those are bad. Those are all great things. But just understand what Scripture is telling us. God is telling us you become wise by walking with the wise. 
Now, this is a very specific Hebrew word that's pronounced halach. Because when in Hebrew, you got to bring it deep from like within your throat. It's like, so it's halach. And it's a very specific word. And here's what it means. It's to be intentionally close in proximity, following, walking, shoulder to shoulder, face to face with someone. That's how we become wise. So principle number one, if you want to become wise, is this. Wisdom is caught more than taught. Wisdom comes not from you sitting alone, you know, reading or learning. Wisdom comes from being around people that are wise and you're catching, watching from them, being such close proximity to them so often that you are becoming wise yourself being around wise people, which means this. Isolation can't give me what consistent time in community with wise people can. Now think about our world today. Think about your life do most of us gravitate towards being around people in community or are we gravitating more towards wanting to be alone? The stats on this are devastating to me. Let me show you from the U.S. Census Bureau does a study. They've been doing this since 2013. They call it the Americans Time Use Survey and they just survey Americans how they're using their time. Now, just look at the top line of this graph. This represents the amount of time we want to be alone versus be with other people. Since 2013, it has skyrocketed. We want to be alone more now than maybe any other time in human history, which is why this. We are now the loneliest, most isolated generation, I think, in human history. And God never intended it for, to be this way. In fact, Genesis chapter 2 says this. What did God say right when he created mankind? The Lord said, it is not good for man to be what? Alone. And yet that's the rallying cry of so many of us. Why well, just want to be alone? I mean, we can sit at home nowadays, right, and just grab our screens and scroll through social media, double click on some likes with people, thinking we have community and people know us and we know other people. And what we know from social media is we're just looking at people's highlight reels and comparing them to our real life. And we wonder why we're so depressed and struggle with our mental health. But everything is moving online nowadays. And it's not all bad. It's just, you know, we can work online, work from home, and we don't have to be around people as much. And we can shop online. We can go to school online. We can get all of our groceries shopped online and delivered right to our doorstep. And God forbid we have to go inside a grocery store. Thank goodness we have self-checkout now so we don't have to look at and interact with another human being. Right? I mean, we are so isolated. Now listen, I am not anti-online. I'm not anti-digital. I'm anti-isolation. Because our isolation is killing us in more ways than you could imagine. In fact, I'll make a really strong statement. Nothing that happens relationally online can replace the power of what happens in person. It is not how God designed it. Walking with someone. We're so isolated and it's so destructive. In fact, the World Health Organization declared loneliness a global health threat. That's the World Health Organization. The U.S. Attorney General said our loneliness and isolation is the equivalent nowadays to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. That's how destructive it is to you, your life. I would say this, the epidemic of our day is not a disease. It's not even the moral decline of our society. It's not drugs or alcohol or obesity. The epidemic of our day is our loneliness and isolation, and it is leading to many of the other ills we're seeing in our society. And we are the loneliest, most isolated generation in human history. Proverbs 18.1 says this, he who isolates himself pursues selfish desires, he rebels against all sound judgment. When you isolate yourself, you are removing yourself from the ability of having wisdom. You don't have sound judgment anymore. And that verse is so convicting to me because I know in my own life, I just, I find myself even now gravitating towards 
Not wanting as many people help. Not wanting to be around people that, that I can seek wisdom from. I just want to seek it myself. I, if I have a need, I want to turn to YouTube. I want to read about it. I want to figure it out myself. I want to be independent. There's two times in my life I've found myself wanting this, this kind of isolation, independence thing more than others. One was when I was a young adult. And I didn't know much, and it was embarrassing to ask people and to reveal how much I didn't know. The other time in my life, honestly, that I, I feel like I struggle with this is right now. Because I, I do know more, and yet it's hard sometimes to admit to people, I still need help. I still need wisdom, which I desperately, desperately, desperately do. But when I look back on my life, I know the times in my life I've grown the most has always been in the context of community. In fact, Proverbs 15 says, plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. And when I've succeeded most is when I've had the right community around me. When Jamie and I first got married, we got in a small group with other young married couples, and then we got around some older married couples that invested in us. It changed our life. It changed my marriage. In fact, I remember getting around this guy, Scott. He'd been married 40 years, and I watched how gentle he was with his wife. And that gentleness began to rub off on me. And Jamie's probably thinking, can it rub off a little bit more? Yeah, you know, it's like I probably need, to need more of that. I do. When, when we had new kids, when we were like young parents, one of our kids was a strong-willed child. Anybody else got a strong-willed child out there? God bless you. Okay, I did too. And man, we struggled. How do you parent? Because it's very different parenting a strong-willed child. And we got in a group that was walking through some parenting material and had some older parents in there. They changed how we parent to this day. When I first became a senior pastor, I got in a group with some other senior pastors that were further along than I was, and it changed my life. It all happened in the context of community. Become wise by walking with the wise. Walking with the wise. That's principle number one. We gotta do life in community to ever become wise. Now the second principle plays into when Solomon says walk with the wise, it begs the question, who should we consider wise? You ever thought about that? Like is someone wise just because they're older? What if someone got a Harvard education? Does that make them wise? What if someone's rich? Are they wise? Biblically, let me tell you the definition of a wise person, and it's so simple. A wise person, principle number two, a wise person is a godly person. And a godly person always has these two traits. You should write this down and meditate on this. A godly person is someone that knows God's word and they live it out. Those two things describe a wise person. A godly person is someone who knows God's word and they live it out. Let's talk about both of those. They know God's word. It means it's likely not a new believer. It's someone that's been a Christian for a little while and they understand God's word. Why? Because Psalm 19 says this, God's word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So the quickest way for you to illuminate the path God wants you to go on is by turning to God's word. But God's word will not always be illuminated in your life unless you involve other people in your life that know God's word. Why is that true? Think about this. Why can't I just sit down by myself and read God's word and figure it all out for myself? Because God's word so oftentimes will fly in the face of what your intuition says to do. What your feelings tell you to do. And because we're all sinners, if we don't have other people helping illuminate God's word, you will find yourself on a horrible path, even though you might even be in God's word yourself. I'll give you an example. It was years ago that I had a really good friend who, um, really wise guy, owns a really, really large business, thousands of employees, uh, makes millions of dollars every year. He, he found himself being sued for a lot of money. I mean, a lot. And he did a really wise thing. He surrounded himself with some men that he wanted to get their advice on what should he do. And I was one of them. And he's explaining the situation, and he just says this. He says, I know, I am confident, 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 that if I play this out, I'll win the lawsuit long term. 
but probably to win it, it's going to take me three to five years, maybe even longer that I'm going to be in court. But I know I can make a whole lot more money if I just take this in court and, and play it out. What do you think I should do? Now, there's lots of things he could have done. And, and you know, some people may give him the advice that, hey, the, the, the best thing financially to do is this guy's trying to screw you over. You take him to court and you take him for every penny and you make as much money as you can. Let me tell you what my advice was to him. I told him, the, I told him this because he, he wasn't hurting for money. I said, you forget the money. You should settle this lawsuit as fast as you can, regardless of the money. Now, why would I tell him that? I only told him that because of God's word. I mean, financially, that is not the best thing to do. But listen to what Jesus said very specifically about these types of situations. He said in Luke chapter 12, verse 58, if someone brings a lawsuit against you and takes you to court, he says, do your best. In other words, not always possible, but do your best to settle the dispute before you get to court. Now, why would Jesus tell us to do something that's not financially, always financially in our best interest? Because how many of you know that spending three to five years in a courtroom, there's a price to your peace of mind? And the question to begin asking is, what amount of money would I pay to get back five, even six, even seven years of my life and my peace? It's a different way of thinking about it, but you'll never get that kind of advice unless you surround yourself with people that truly know God's word. But they can't just know God's word, they have to be living it out. Now this is big. Let me point something out to you. And you know this intuitively. There is a big difference between knowledge and wisdom, right? I was talking to Dave Stone this week and I said, how would you describe the difference between knowledge and wisdom? And he said this, he said, yeah, I know. You know, he's, you know, he's jovial, he said, you know, he's like, you know, wisdom is knowing, or knowledge, he said knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. <laughs> now you know a tomato is a fruit, but how stupid would it be to put it in a fruit salad? I thought, you know, only people from Kentucky need to know that, all right? <laughs> Knowledge is information. Wisdom is application, applying it to your life. And you want people that are living out God's word, they just don't know it. The Pharisees knew God's word. They had it memorized. I mean, you know this as a kid. You know, what mattered more, if your parents told you the right thing to do or you saw them living it out? If your parents told you the right thing to do and you saw them living a different way, in most instances, you ignored your parents because it matters how we live. And by the way, real life plays out this way all the time. I mean, for example, let's say this year you wanted to lose some weight. You wanted to get more physically fit. What would matter more? Being around people that knew what to tell you to do. Here's how to eat. Here's your workout plan. Here's exactly what to do. Or being around people that are living it out. There was a study done recently that, that I think is mind-blowing. It was released in the New England Journal of Medicine by doctors Nicholas Christingas and James Fowler. They did a groundbreaking study. They took 12,000 people, and they followed them and studied them over 32 years, and they just wanted to know the effect of these 12,000 people, their social network, the people they were connected to, how much did that impact the way they lived their life? And here's what they found, summary of the study. Who you're surrounded with, you will mirror. Psychologists call it the mirroring, the mirroring effect. You will mirror, in most ways, the closest people around you. In fact, they found that if you have a close friend that begins gaining weight, the probability of you gaining weight is 71%. We mirror the people around us, which is why it matters so much who we decide to be around. But spiritually, this matters more than any other area of your life. That's why you can't just find people that just know God's word. You have to find people that are living it out. I have a pastor friend who says it this way. It's impossible to live the right life with the wrong friends. 
It is impossible to have a right life and right living if you're not surrounded with the right people. The wrong people around you will just drag you, drag you that way. And that's why the last part of this verse is such a really big deal. Proverbs 13, 20 says, walk, become wise by walking with the wise. So we talked about walking. We talked about what's a wise person. But the last half of the verse says, but hang out with fools and you watch your life fall to pieces. Which means, who's a fool? Well, one definition of a fool, biblically, is someone that doesn't know God. And that's one definition. But I think a deeper definition, this is a definition Jesus gives over and over again, is someone that claims to know God, claims to be a Christian, but then lives their life by their own set of standards and rules. And there's a lot of people in our world today that would say, I'm a follower of Jesus, and they do not follow this book. They do whatever they want. They have their own set of rules. And they want you to do the same thing. You do you, boo. Right? I mean, this is the, the signs of our times. That's what a fool is like. A fool is someone that claims to be a Christian and know God's word and does not live it out. And 1 Corinthians 15, says, Don't you dare be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. And some of us are like, well, I got some Christian friends. No, are your Christian friends truly living it out? Or are they fools? Proverbs 13, 20 says we have to become wise by walking with the wise. And if you hang out with fools, your life falls apart, which means the third principle is this. Life begins to fall apart the moment, the moment I pull away from godly community. This is why if you could peer into my heart as a pastor, my vision for every person in our church is not just that you show up consistently on the weekends, that's so important, but that you have godly community during the week. It's the only way you'll find wisdom to live the life you wanna live. And at CCV, godly community is found in a CCV group what we call a CCV group. And a CCV group is simply a group of 10 to 15 people, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less, who gather during the week in a living room or some other setting to do life together, to get into God's word and to help each other stay connected and take their next step. And a lot of our CCV groups, they'll follow the weekend message, which I love because it's so important that you don't, don't come on the weekend and listen to the message, right? But that you put it into practice. And a group is is so critical in like how to apply it to your life and how should I, what should I do with that? And that's what a lot of groups do is they take the weekend message and begin discussing it and applying it. There's other groups that have uh, topics they dive into. There might be groups that look at marriage or parenting or finances or you know, maybe like dealing with some young adult issues. There's groups that, that deal with grief. There's groups that deal with overcoming an addiction. Amazing groups. If you're action-oriented, there's some activity groups. There's groups that get together for maybe hiking or another activity or, or doing service projects, all with the goal then of like trying to get into God's word still together around those activities and taking next steps in your faith. There are so many different kinds of groups, which means there's a group for you and there's a group near you. There really is. In fact, I want to show you a map. We now have at CCV over 17,000 people in a CCV group with over 600 groups across the valley, which means there's a group for everyone. Now, not every group is for everyone, but there's a group for everyone, which means if you tried a group in the past and it didn't work, listen, there's another group for you out there. You gotta keep taking a step to get in one of those groups. And just so I'm clear, what we're doing right now, this is not community. Community doesn't happen in a row. Community happens in a circle. And there's circles all over this valley just waiting for you if you're not in one yet. In fact, I want to zoom in on one specific group that meets around our central Scottsdale campus. It, it's one of my dear friends. He's one of the most godly men I know. His name's Sherwood Duhon. And I want you to see his group and the change that's happening from people doing life and community with godly people. Watch this.
So my wife Kate and I grew up in families where our parents always took us to church every weekend. Uh, my dad was a minister, so you know I was at church and uh, back row was not an option. So when Kate and I started dating, it became very apparent that we'd been taught different things. And if we were gonna be married, we wanted to be unified. So when we were trying to get unified and get on the same page, we started going to church like most uh, people would. And we got invited to a small group. As we sat and just listened to people's convictions about what God had done in their lives and, and what the Bible said, we started to develop our own convictions. And it's that that really changed the trajectory of our lives. When we finally found CCV, we were already convinced uh, that that was something that we always wanted to be a part of. And because it had meant so much to us in our marriage and raising a family, uh, we wanted to offer that same thing to other people, the same benefit that we had got from being part of a group we wanted to pass on to others. So we made a decision that we were gonna host in our home a small group. And that simple decision has been something that God has done some amazing things through. Uh, I, I think of a lot of the guys that, that came out of our small group, like Tim, who, as far as I know, didn't know God at all and never attended church. But he was our neighbor and we invited him to have barbecue one night at our small group. Uh, Tim came to the barbecue and then he started attending the small group. And then he started studying the Bible and he became a Christian, was baptized. Uh, Jeremiah is another example who was living a life that he knew wasn't in line with what Christ wanted. And now he's leading his own small group. We actually have a surprise for you. So Jeremiah um, sent this video to share with you. So when you're ready, you hit that button. Okay. Hi Sherwood, I wanted to take a moment and just thank you so much for being my brother in Christ, uh, for being my friend, uh, and for being a godly man who has taught me so much. Um, when Rachel and I decided to take a leap of faith uh, almost three years ago and join a small group, I came to your group. Um, and at that time I was looking for someone with wisdom um, and who was Christ-like. Um, and I found that in you. And at the time you and I didn't know, but you were a catalyst. You propelled my life in a way that I could not have imagined um, simply by just trying to emulate Jesus. I love you and uh, you're the best. <clears throat> well, that just goes to show you that it's not me. <laughs> it's God. He, he just one of, one of those stories that, uh, you know, just proves that if we are a little bit faithful with planting, a little bit faithful with watering, God's gonna give the increase. You know, when I think of all the things the small group has done for us, I just want other people to have that. And, you know, God is waiting for people to show up so he can move in their lives. And that's the biggest part of it, just being there. You know, I think a lot of people, when they think about getting into a small group, they, they think, well, everyone else is going to know the Bible, and I don't know the Bible very well, and I don't have anything to contribute. And, uh, you know, I would tell people that might be thinking that, nothing's further from the truth. Because the best thing that you can contribute is you. And God will take that simple act of faith and obedience and he will multiply it more than we could ever imagine. My goodness, I'm sure would. I love what he said. He said the best thing you can bring to a group is just you. And you may be one community away from God radically changing your life. Just like Jeremiah. I love what Jeremiah said. He said, I mean, you were the catalyst. Getting into this group was the catalyst that changed my life. And remember, Sherwood's group is not a group that represents every group at our church. There's groups for young adults. There's groups for young marrieds. There's groups for, that have 
parents with little kids, parents with teenagers, empty nesters, singles. There's groups of seniors and everything in between. I'm just telling you, there's a group out there for you. And if you're not a part of a group, I want to challenge every person here. What are you waiting for? Wisdom is on the other side of you taking a step into a group. And if you need a group, you can get on our app today. We have a group finder that you simply type in your address. It pulls all the groups around you. You can go talk to a pastor right outside your service today, and they will help you get connected to a group. But I just wonder today if there's someone here and your life isn't going the way you thought. You keep asking God, God, I need some wisdom. Like, I need you. And God's looking at you going like, you're not doing the one thing that would give you the wisdom I want to give you. By just getting into a godly community. And you're thinking, why friends? You know your friends are not the right friends. Your friends don't have the marriage you want. Your friends don't have the values that you want to emulate. They're not taking you down the path you even want to go. Sure, you have fun. Way to go. You're having fun. Let me tell you what's not fun. When your marriage falls apart, when your relationships crumble, when you have a kid struggling, when your finances are just in the pits, when you, when you don't know what to do. And God has some of you here to say, you are one community away from your life radically changing Next month, Jamie and I will celebrate 24 years of marriage. And we're, I love that woman. For 24 years of our marriage, we have been a part of a small group. Never once, not one year have we not been a part of a small group. And we would tell you personally, it's changed our life and it continues to change our life. We will never not be a part of a group. In fact, one of our greatest joys now is watching other people in our group watching their life change. It's like Sherwood was talking about, which means some of you, listen to me, you need to step up and lead a group. God's equipped you. God's gifted you. You're a leader. Step up and lead. Even if you don't feel qualified, you just need to be available because there's other people that need you. So if you want to step up and lead, you just go out and talk to one of our pastors. They'll get you connected with leading a group. But if you need a group, just sign up, show up, and watch your life change I was at our Midtown campus a couple weeks ago. I had a guy walk up to me and he said this. He said, I've been coming here for years and you know, when, when you're preaching, you've, you've kind of shamed me about small groups for a long time. I was like, well, thank you. you know? <laughs> he said, last year, all these years I put it off. He said, last year I finally took that step. He said, dang it, you were right. <laughs> and someone has you, you here today to say, it's time it is time to draw a line in the sand. No more excuses. I get that you're busy. I get that your kids have sports. I get all the excuses, but there's no excuse for you seeking wisdom and for God to change your life. So I want to invite us all to stand to our feet like we've done every week of this series. Just stand up. This doesn't mean you're taking the declaration. I'm not going to pressure you, but if you know you need to make the declaration for godly community today, or you want to re-up, because you're already in it, I want you to say this loud and proud of me as a moment to say, I declare. Would you say this with me? This year, with God's help and the power of the Holy Spirit, I declare I will seek wisdom. My independence, isolation, or even the wrong friends are the enemies of my growth. I refuse to do life apart from godly community. If you made that, that commitment, I'm going to pray God gives you the courage to follow through. Let's pray. God, I know there's someone here today that just needs their life to change. They need wisdom, and they are one community away from you transforming their life. So I pray that they would just, after the service, get on the app, search for a group. They can see the leader of the group. They can see all the details. They can sign up, help them to show up, and just Get over the fear of even walking into someone's house or going to something new. God, none of those fears should keep us away from what you want from us, for us. So God, I, I pray for that. I pray for the person that needs to step up and lead a group. 
Would all of us surround ourselves with the right people so we can live the right life for you? And we pray all this in Jesus' name. And we all said, amen. Amen. Hey, next week, I'm going to preach maybe my favorite week of this I Declare series. We'll see you then. Have a great week, CCV.